and this is my grand and which has in that we talk about the residual finiteness of quantum frameworks and groups of finite spaces. <clears throat> okay, well thanks very much to the organizers for uh, organizing this great workshop and for inviting me to come uh, give a little talk here. So uh, yeah, so I want to say a little bit about some recent joint work with uh, Alexandra Kirbasito from uh, Buffalo and Amelie Frelon from Paris. And possibly if there's time, also some joint work with David Roberson, who's also in, uh, he's at the Technical University of Denmark. And uh, the, the subject of my talk uh, is uh, about some examples of compact quantum groups. Uh, and these are the quantum symmetry groups of finite spaces. And for the most part, the finite spaces I'm going to be considered are just finite sets with no additional structure. So what I'm really after is to describe and say a little bit about the quantum symmetry group of a finite set. Okay. So the, the, the goal here is to, to somehow describe the quantum symmetries of a finite space. X. So here X is, yes, as I said, this is a finite set. Uh, let's say it has capital N elements. And sometimes I'll uh, uh, impose some additional structure on X, but for the most part, for most of this talk, it'll just be a finite set with no structure. So sometimes X could be equal to a finite graph or a finite metric space. Okay, so I can endow X in, in, if I want with some additional uh, structure, okay? So we want to understand what are the quantum symmetries of a finite space X. And mathematically, these are described by a quantum group. And it's going to actually be a compact quantum group. G plus of X, okay? So this notation maybe is not so standard and may seem kind of strange right now. Uh, but yeah, so G group plus means, well, what we're gonna see very shortly is that if you have a finite set and you ask about a quantum group which acts on this set, you're gonna get a lot more than just the permutation group or some subgroup of the permutation group which acts on it. So this plus here is to indicate somehow that if you allow quantum symmetries of a space, you're going to have more, more symmetries. Okay, so this plus means just sort of more, and X is the initial data. So for the most part, let's just start with uh, X, a collection of N points with no extra structure. Okay, so I want to know what the quantum symmetries of n points are. And uh, well, <clears throat> uh, from the perspective of Hopf algebras or quantum groups, the natural thing to do is, so you're going to have uh, this g plus x, right? This is really described by a Hopf algebra. Hopf star algebra. Okay. A. Okay, and this is a Hopf star algebra, which it's going to have a, a co product, an antipode, and a co unit. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, this Hopf star algebra is going to be determined by a co-action on the function algebra of the set, okay? So A is uh, uh, 
eraser. So maybe what I want here is switch the eraser. So, so we want to have a Hopf algebra together with a coaction alpha from the space of functions on x. So this is the commutative finite dimensional algebra of functions on x. I'm thinking of this as a finite dimensional C star algebra, a commutative one. And a coaction just means that uh, C of x as a vector space is considered as a co-module over uh, this Hopf algebra. And uh, this, this, this co-module map is also going to be a star homomorphism of algebras. So here. So alpha, or rather, so C of x is a co-module algebra. over this hot algebra, okay? So that means that alpha is a star homomorphism, okay? And it's gonna satisfy some compatibility conditions with respect to the co-product, okay? So you're gonna have alpha, okay? This will take me from C of X to A tensor C of X, and uh, uh, then what I could do is I could apply alpha again on the right side, and that should be the same as uh, first applying alpha and applying the co-product on the right hand side. Um, so we want to have this co-module structure on C of X, and we want some universal property as well. Okay, so what do I mean by a universal property here? Well, if I'm thinking about classical groups like the permutation group Sn acting on X, okay, well, uh, the action of the permutation group is first of all faithful on, on, a, on a finite endpoint set. And the other thing is that any group which acts faithfully on this set X is actually realized canonically as a subgroup of SN, okay? So in that sense, the, you can think of the permutation group as the, the universal group which acts faithfully on an endpoint set, okay? So somehow, one, <coughs> what we want to do here is uh, translate this universal property uh, to the language of Hopf algebras. And the idea here is, what we want is that, well, okay, this map alpha is okay going to be given in terms of the canonical basis so alpha of ei so remember c of x is generated as a c star algebra by n projections together with the relations that the sum of these projections is one and ei equals ei star equals ei squared so it's projection so this map will be determined on these basis vectors or generators by some formula with coefficients in A and in uh, C of X. And what we want here is that uh, A to be generated as a star algebra by the coefficients, uij, okay? So this is what's called faithfulness in the language of Hopf algebras. And the other thing I want is that if I have another Hopf algebra, B together with its co-product, uh, and co-action, beta, from A into B tensor A as above, then we have a factorization uh, through alpha, okay? So there exists a surjective, unique so surjective. Is on C I'm sorry? Uh, beta is on C 
Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we want to have that there exists a subjective star, uh, pop star morphism, uh, pi from A on to B, so that beta is actually um, pi tensor identity of alpha. Okay. And this is universality. Okay. So again, if you think about what this is in terms of the things we know and love about classical groups acting on uh, yeah, classical groups acting on a on a space. Um, well, maybe we should introduce some notation first. Some notation here. I'm going to write a as uh, thinking of this as the Hopf algebra or func quantized function algebra on the quantum space g plus of x. Okay, so I want to think of this as sort of the algebra of representative functions. Okay, and A is generated by the coordinates of the defining action. Okay, so that really, if you think about it in terms of commutative algebras of representative functions on groups, this really means that the group is acting faithfully on this uh, uh, function algebra or space, underlying space. And then this uh, existence of this surjective star homomorphism is saying that if we think of B as, again, representative functions on some other quantum group G, then uh, this morphism is saying that uh, you really have a surjection from the function algebra uh, A to this function algebra B, which means that you can realize B as sitting inside of it. Uh, or you can think of G as some, somehow a quantum subgroup of, of G plus of X. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, right, so this is the thing we want to consider. And I never said anything about the coproduct here, so just for informational purposes. The coproduct is essentially determined by this, uh, this condition right here. Okay, and it, it makes it that so that delta of uij is a sum over k of uik tensor u k j. S and epsilon can be fine, but I'm never going to use them in this talk, so I'll just for time's sake skip that. Okay. Uh, okay, so classically, so x is an endpoint set. Uh, the automorphism group of x is just the permutation group on n letters. And what we want to consider here then is some maybe some notation that's more in tune with this. So I'm going to write g plus of x as uh, Sn plus. So it's some <coughs> enrichment of the permutations acting on an endpoint set to allow for quantum permutations. And a concrete description of this is easy to write down. Okay. So this here, this is the quantum permutation group. So I should think of Sn as being a quotient of G of X? Or G plus yeah, X. as a quantum subgroup, exactly. <laughs> so this is the quantum permutation group. Sorry, and I said quotient, I didn't say subgroup. The function, or it's the function it's algebra is a quotient, yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll write, uh, yeah, I'll say that right, explicitly. So, so uh, yeah, so O of X plus, this is equal to the universal star algebra generated by uh, variables u i j one less than or equal to i j less than or equal to n, together with the following relations imposed. So one is that uh, I want u i j to be equal to uij squared to be equal to uij star. So we have an algebra generated by self-adjoint idempotence. Uh, I want um, 
If I think of these U i j's sitting inside of an n by n matrix, forming an n by n matrix, I want the row sums and column sums to, to all add up to one. Okay, so for all i and j, we want that the sum over k of u i k equals uh, one, and that's also going to be equal to the sum over k of u k j equals. All right, and then finally, three, um, I want these projections, so I'm looking at a star algebra here, so I want these, I need to add some additional relations uh, that, that would be automatic if I was actually working in a C star algebra, but here I'm just looking at an algebra, so I want these to be uh, orthogonal projections, so I want that U I K U I L, this should be equal to zero if k and l are different. So delta k l. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Delta k l. U i k. I also want u i k u j k to be equal to delta <coughs> i j times u i k. Okay. All right. And again, this is a star algebra. We can turn it into a hop star algebra by the same formula as before. Can, you, can we say what is the image of u i j inside the functions on a symmetric group? Yes, yeah, so the, that's right. So, the, so your question is, what is the quotient map? Yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, so here um, we have a quotient map. <coughs> from the, uh, this non, typically non commutative pop star algebra onto the ordinary algebra of functions on SN, and it's basically defining, basically modding out by the commutator idea. Right? Okay, uh, explicitly this is just uij gets sent to the function sigma ij, which is the ij coordinate function on Sn, if you view it as a matrix group of permutation matrices. Okay. okay, so I'm thinking of Sn as 0, 1 permutation matrices. Okay. So this is the canonical <laughs> realization of that sign is okay. So in other words, the quantum symmetries of a finite set consisting of n points are a, a very natural generalization of the Hopf algebra of representative functions on Sn. You just look at the algebra generated by the coordinate functions on Sn, which have in, implicitly built into them a commutation relation between all these coordinates. And you say, well, I want all of the relations to hold that I have on Sn coordinate functions, but I'm not going to insist that they that these variables commute. Okay, so Sn plus is sort of a what what, what is often called a liberation or free analog of uh, the classical permutation group, okay? And in particular, the thing that's very important for us to have in mind is that in quantum group language, Sn is a quantum subgroup of Sn plus, okay? So what I, what I really mean here is that um, this map here, this canonical surjection, which is quotienting by the commutator ideal, this, uh, this map is not only a surjection of star algebras and morphism of star al algebras, but it's actually 
respecting all of the Hopf-Star algebra structure. So it really is uh, the analog of a restriction map from functions on this quantum space to functions on the classical space. Okay, so, so this is sort of the, the algebra that I'm interested in studying. Um, and in particular, I want to sort of understand and, or say a little bit about um, C star algebra or von Neumann algebra completions, and also some purely algebraic properties of this algebra, okay? So let, let me just start off by saying a few words about the structure of this algebra, this Hopf star algebra. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, in low dimensions or, or low, low uh, when we're looking at small set sizes, namely a one point or a two point or a three point set, this uh, algebra turns out to be commutative. So no quantum symmetries. Okay, so if you have a small set, it turns out that this universal algebra here, these relations are enough to deduce that they actually, the variables you like already commute. So this quotient map is actually injective, and you're not looking at anything other than the classical permutation group through the lens of its algebra representative functions. Okay, so. Uh, what what actually happens is uh, when n is bigger than or equal to four, things become very different. So when n is equal to four, this algebra is now all of a sudden infinite dimensional and non and highly non commutative. Or well, okay, certainly non commutative. Maybe highly is a bit much. Uh, uh, and there's an easy reason to see this. If I look at the uh, group algebra of the free product of Z2 with itself, okay, I can think of this as the universal star algebra generated by two projections. So P and Q are free projections. So they're projections, by that I mean self-adjoint idempotents, which satisfy no relations between them. Sorry, that's your product, uh, symbol for free product. Sorry? Uh, you could oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, star <coughs> algebra generated by free, two free self-adjoint idempotents. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, very known community algebra. Um, and it's a quotient of O of S4 plus, okay? And the reason this is the case is because uh, if I take my UIJs, so what's the map? Maybe I'll continue over here. These UIJs So the map is that uh, the matrix of uij's i and j less than or equal to four get sent to the following four by four matrix where I have p, p, one minus p in the upper left corner, one minus p here, okay, uh, zero in the off diagonal terms, and then q, q, one minus q, one minus q. <clears throat> so if you look at this matrix of elements, there's some zeros, there's some projections. Uh, if you sum along any row or column, you get uh, the identity, their self-adjoint idempotents, uh, and yeah, obviously your orthogonality. Okay, so, uh, right, so we have this. Uh, and of course, that tells us that this is the quotient. Uh, in fact, actually, something more is known. We actually have a very explicit model. So O of S4 plus, this is due to Bonica, 
Oh, no. I'll be getting called in. From around 2008. Uh, and what they showed was that this algebra has a rather explicit embedding into the space of continuous functions on SU2 with values in M4. So it's a non-commutative algebra. It's infinite dimensional. Uh, but uh, it's nevertheless sort of tame in, in, in the sense of uh, we can sort of really explicitly describe it. Okay. Right. Now, that's when n is 4. Uh, when n is 5, things become even more poorly understood. Okay. So if n is bigger than or equal to 5, things become wild in, in the sense of, uh, well, maybe if you're interested in non amenable groups and things like that, uh, the algebras O of S by o, o of S N plus look more like group algebras of non amenable free groups or something like that. Okay, so what is known is the following. So, uh, well, first of all, these SN pluses are actually very nice. They come from very nice hot star algebras. They're actually unitarizable hot star algebras or hot star algebras of functions on. Sorry, I, I don't understand what you wrote on the top line of the last board that you wrote. You wrote URJ maps to and then. Yeah, so this, so what I'm doing is I'm sending the generators to, to some elements in the range. And I am U11 maps to P, yes, U1 exactly. maps to 1 minus P, U13 maps to 0. Exactly, yeah. And that's, yeah. So that's the, exactly. the morphism will be defined uh, uniquely by, by this map. Yeah. And then extend by the algebraic structure. So I didn't really emphasize this, but this is really uh, a compact quantum group uh, in the sense of Voronovich, which I guess you might hear a little bit more about in uh, some of the mini course lectures later on this week. But for us, this means that there exists a faithful trace tau on this algebra O of Sn plus for all n. Okay. So in particular, uh, with this faithful trace, uh, we get a faithful representation of this algebra as bounded operators on some GNS Hilbert space. So this algebra has a universal C star completion in it, which in which it embeds. Okay. So what this means is we can consider some operator algebras, for example, something I'll call the universal C star algebra of C of S n plus. C of S n plus, so we want to again think of this as quantization of function algebras on a group. So this is meant to be like continuous functions on S n plus, and this U means universal. So this will be the universal C star completion of the Hopf algebra of S n plus. So this uh, one could consider as some enormous C star algebra. Uh, we could also <coughs> consider uh, the reduced version, C r of S n plus. This will be the GNS image with respect to the Haar measure or Haar trace of, uh, let's say, all of S n plus. Okay, and I could also consider a von Neumann algebra, so L infinity of Sn plus, okay, uh, which will be just be the double commutator. So here, the this is really sitting inside of bounded operators on L two of Sn plus. And this here is just a GNS over space. Okay, and then I take the double commutant inside. Uh, so again, the intuition you should have about these objects is this. Um, if you like discrete groups, you should think of this as somehow the universal C star algebra of some 
discrete group-like object, which can be made precise if you have some sort of quantum Pontryagin quantum duality, and there'll be some discrete quantum group associated to SN plus, but that's sort of not really necessary for us. <clears throat> Another way to think of this is really, this is the space of continuous functions on this compact quantum space. <laughs> And those two pictures are really in, in bijection with some Fourier transform. Here, uh, what I want to do is I want to think of continuous functions represented as multiplication operators on the L2 space. Okay. Classically, for a compact group, of course, these two algebras are the same thing because the Haar measure is stable. Okay. And then, of course, uh, I can look at the uh, bounded, essentially bounded measures of functions acting on the L2 space, and that'll be this one. That um, you can also think of this as uh, the reduced group C star algebra of some discrete group, and this would be the von Neumann representation. So we have these gadgets here, and the point of introducing these is I just want to just briefly mention some, uh, some things that are known. So for this universal beast here, uh, what's known is this is uh, um, it's actually a non-exact C star algebra. Uh, so very highly non-immutable. Um, this thing here, this reduced C star algebra, uh, is it turns out to be exact, but non-nuclear. So some words I'll probably, I'm not gonna define, but for those of you who know, these words that might be of interest. So this algebra has the complete metric approximation property. This is, this is a result of uh, actually Makoto and uh, uh, Amory Frelon and uh, Kenny de Kummer. Uh, it's a simple, typically a simple C star algebra with unique traits. And there are nice K-theory things that have been computed for this as well. In particular, you could distinguish these reduced algebras using them. That's the result of Christian Bull, Glasgow. Um, at the von Neumann algebra level, these are strongly solid, typically strongly solid to one factor uh, with a weak star completely bounded approximation property and the hogger up property. Okay. So yeah, it is not known whether they're isomorphic to pre-group factors. <coughs> the conjecture is uh, that they are actually strongly one-bounded, which means uh, they are definitely not pre-group factors. So, yeah, so it's not known uh, at this point, but my guess would be but but in some sense they do look in terms of all of those lists of properties if you, if you think of everything in analogy with the free group whole c star algebra or so what's the evidence for the only one bounded so uh the canonical generators have free entropy dimension one so there's at least one generating set which has uh, free entropy dimension, which would contradict an isomorphism with three group factors, of course, free entropy dimension is a bit. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are some strengthenings of this uh, free entropy business, which has been applied uh, in, in some other examples where you can actually strengthen this to a non isomorphism result, but that's certainly out of the out of reach right now. Okay, so yeah, so these things are really, uh, you know, kind of complicated objects. Uh, there are somehow free algebras, right? So they're algebras together with some minimal set of relations, but besides that, they're, they're sort of free. So in, in, in that sense, they look kind of like group algebras of free groups. So a natural question, and this is really the topic of this talk, uh, is, if we want to think of these uh, algebras uh, as sort of analogs of free groups, you might ask this question, is SN plus 
residually finite. Dimensional. Okay. So really what I mean is, uh, is, is the algebra O of SN plus residually finite dimensional for all N? And that's equivalent to just asking, uh, do there exist a sequence of integers, N of K, K going from one to infinity, so that this Hopf algebra, O of SN plus, embeds into the direct product as a star sub algebra of a product of these full matrix algebra. So again, if you think about free groups, the replacement here would be, this would be the group algebra of a free group. Free groups are residually finite. Uh, and uh, this is true. And what, what this really is, is that you, you, if you have any non-commutative polynomial in the algebra of generate, generated by the generators of this algebra, can you find a finite dimensional representation which is non-zero on that? You could ask a harder question as well, and that is, is the full C star algebra, C U of S N plus R of T. Okay. <coughs> so if you again think about the analogy with free groups, this uh, is true. So the full C star algebra of a free group is uh, R of T. And the proof is really utilizing freeness in, in some sense, together with some uh, unitary dilation. So here, we have no idea whether this is true. But this, this result is true, okay? This is true. Uh, and this is uh, joint work with uh, Pierre C2 and Fraval. All right. So what I want to do is, in the last little bit, I want to explain to you why uh, there are sufficiently many finite dimensional representations of this algebra in order to separate points, okay? So, okay, so again, if you're thinking about free groups, the, the natural thing you do there is you have uh, a, fa um, a faithful representation of the free group in some infinite dimension, on some infinite dimensional Hilbert space that gives you some <coughs> unitaries. And what you do is you, you uh, cut down these unitaries, you compress them by finite rank projections. And uh, of course, you're no longer going to be unitary anymore when you cut down to finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but then you can dilate back and, and, and do some tricks. And, and you see that uh, there's a natural sort of functorial way to construct finite dimensional representations of these algebras, uh, three group algebras. But in the case of these, uh, it's very hard to write down explicit finite dimensional models for O of S N plus. Okay, so of course you can always quotient to the abelian quotient, right? So O of S N is a finite dimensional model, but that's somehow very far from being close to giving you something uh, which would separate points of non, uh, separate non commutative polynomials. There are other approaches which are um, based on what are called flat matrix models. So you look at uh, rank one projections, UIJ, um, and do some calculations there and things can come up. But somehow it's ex somehow the, the, the relations here are very uh, sensitive to the type of methods you would use in establishing R of Venus, for example, for uh, free group algebra. So these techniques are not going to work, uh, and, and it's very hard to somehow find these explicit models. So an alternate approach is actually using using rigid, well, maybe representation theory. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So what I, what I, what I mean here is I'm going to 
uh, look at the rigid C star tensor category rep of Sn plus. So this is the tensor category of finite dimensional unitary modules <coughs> over the corresponding Hopf algebra. Okay, and study properties of this rigid C star tensor category uh, and some constructions uh, at the level of this category allow you to um, sort of do some uh, some nice uh, make some nice observations which allow you to without explicitly writing down a faithful representation find uh, lots of or at least prove that there are sufficiently many okay So in this category here, the objects are finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, which come equipped with co unitary co-module structures over this Hopf algebra. Okay. And uh, so here's the idea. So we know S4 plus, this embeds into continuous functions on a compact space with values in four by four matrices. So this is clearly a really finite dimensional algebra. Okay. Uh, we also know that, uh, well, S4, um, no wait. So here's the idea. So we want to use RFD for O of S4 plus to get representations of O of S5 plus, which is something we don't know at this point, which is RFD, okay? Okay, so here's the idea. So, well, for one thing, we have S5 is a quantum subgroup of S5 plus. <coughs> Uh, but also, we can think of S4 plus as a quantum subgroup of S5 plus in a natural way, right? So you have this four by four matrix of generators of S4 plus, okay? And here you have this five by five matrix of generators of S5 <coughs> plus. And what you can do is you map the five by five matrix to a five by five matrix where you have a one in the upper left corner, uh, and then the sub matrix, the four by four sub matrix that contain the generators of S4 plus. So what I'm doing is I'm thinking of S4 plus as a, a stabilizer subgroup. Okay. Uh, okay. So more precisely, is, this, is that clear to everyone? So I, I'm basically, you know, S5, uh, sitting inside of S5 plus, that's clear. So you, you have uh, O of S5 plus down to O of S5. That would send the matrix of generators of O of S5 plus to the coordinate functions on um, S5. But I also consider O of S4 plus, and what I do is I, I send the UIJs to the matrix where I have one, uh, zero, 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 and then these are the generators of O of S4 plus. So this is really a quantum analog of thinking of S4 inside of S5 as a vertex or a point stabilizer. Okay, so we have morphisms here and here, uh, and these are Hopf algebra <laughs> morphisms. And uh, so, and we know that this is RFD. This is RFD. Uh, and the idea is you somehow want to use these representations here to construct representations up at this level, <coughs> okay? So you wanna use reps of S5 and S4 plus to get representations of O of S5 plus. <clears throat> okay. 
so the, the general picture here is as follows. Um, suppose I just have a compact quantum group. Okay, and I have two subgroups, G1 and G2, quantum subgroups. Uh, then, of course, for any pair of objects, H and K, inside of the representation category of G, we can view H and K as representations of the subgroups. Okay. Okay. So any representation of G will induce a representation of G1 and G2. This is the analog of restricting representations. At the quantum level, you take the co-representation matrix and you send it down to a co-representation matrix associated to the subgroup using the morphism that you have, which define these things here. And then you know, of course, that uh, the morphism space So the G, uh, the morphisms from H to K inside of my category rep G <coughs> are going to be contained in the intersection of the morphism spaces of the two subgroups. Okay, okay so for any subgroups you have this relatively straightforward fact. And now, We're going to say that G is topologically <laughs> generated by G1 and G2. So that we'll, we'll write as G equals G1, G2 in angle brackets. Okay, if for all H and K, we actually have an equality instead of an inclusion. So the morphisms, the G morphisms from H to K are exactly in the intersection of the GI morphisms on the same spaces. So of course, when you restrict representations to subgroups, the, uh, <coughs> in the spaces of intertwiners grow and if you have a group that's generated by two subgroups, then it's pretty easy to see that this condition will hold. And this is the quantum analog of this fact. So in other words, you can obtain the representation category of G from, or the morphisms from the representation category of G from the morphisms of the representation categories of the two quantum subgroups. So this is really a purely algebraic or linear algebraic uh, notion, but it has important consequences. The proposition, uh, if GI, or rather O of GI is RFD, and G is generated by G1 and G2, then this algebra here is RFD. So this is maybe a, a black box, so I'm not going to explain how you do this, but it turns out you can essentially use this fact to manufacture from representations of the corresponding GIs many, many, many more representations of G in very, very large tensor powers of the corresponding spaces. And somehow by taking really large tensor powers, you get uh, somehow faithfulness or asymptotic faithfulness of these representations. Uh, whereas these quotient maps, of course, are always very far from So back to uh, uh, SN plus. So for SN plus, okay, what we want is, well, we want Sn plus to be generated by Sn and Sn minus one plus for all n bigger than or equal to five. 
because this would inductively using this proposition prove starting at n equals four that uh, S five plus uh, would be topologically generated by S four plus and S n. Uh, these two hot numbers are RFP, so you get hot, uh, RFP for S five plus. And then you just continue inductively. Uh, so proposition. Uh, this is actually older. Uh, so what we could do was actually uh, prove that uh, that this thing, which I call star, this wish of ours, we could prove that it was true for n bigger than or equal to six. Okay, so very strangely, uh, you know, checking these intersection properties of these morphism spaces could be checked or it could be done when n is bigger than or equal to six. But as soon as n is equal to five, you're somehow operating in a low dimensional uh, family of vector spaces. And this low dimensionality prevents you from doing the same argument that, that we had. Okay, so it's true for n equal to six, and that's bad, right? Because we can't start the induction. Okay. Um, so in the last few minutes, I want to just mention how, uh, in some sense, subfactors comes to the rescue here. <laughs> So we want to we want to we want to get this result for five, okay? N equals five. Uh, so here, what you can do is you can ask actually uh, an even more difficult question. So so we can ask a quite harder question, and that is classify all quantum subgroups okay uh, which contain SN uh, and uh, are sitting inside of SN plus conjecture uh, G is either SN or Sn plus for all n, bigger than or equal to five. <clears throat> right, uh, and, and the point here is that if you had an answer to this conjecture when n is five, well, what we're doing is we're looking at uh, G equal to Sn generated with Sn minus one plus. This is contained in Sn plus and contained in, contains Sn. Uh, it's non-commutative, so it's not this, so it would have to be this, okay? Uh, and when n is equal to five, uh, this problem is solved. Okay, and why? We know the subfactor planar algebras up to isomorphism at index five. And uh, okay, so okay, I'm gonna. I guess I should stop now, but I can't help but maybe just say a little bit about. What this what this is here. So the idea is as follows. Um, uh, theorem So uh, one direction of the theorem was a little bit older due to Theodore Bonica, and most recently in 2016, the converse was true. And that is that there's a bijection between 
uh, quantum subgroups S N can, uh, which which are contained in G, which contained in S N plus, and subfactor certain subfactor. I'm eliminating some planar algebra by including S N. Uh, certain subfactor planar algebras uh, Q sitting inside of the graph planar algebra associated to the Bradley diagram of the Markov inclusion of the scalar C inside of C to the N. The so this is a certain, what's that? It's C to the N. C to the N, yeah. The N star. Sorry? The N star. N star. One thing into N things. The graph is just there. Ah. Well, yeah, so I guess it's just how does it play? the graph planar algebra associated with this. And, and the point here is that uh, you basically eliminate everything at index 5, okay, and the index here of Q of this subfactor planar algebra is going to be 5 when n is 5. Uh, and there's temporarily Leap Jones there. A whole bunch of things that are uh, finite depth, I guess. Uh, which cannot have, which cannot correspond to anything of this form. Okay. So somehow you can just open up this classification list and just check, and it's very easy to check uh, at, at uh, index five that the only thing that works is actually at index plus, which gives you temporarily of Jones. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Graph planar algebra is, uh, is this like a star graph? So you have like one thing with like n spokes around it. Yeah, I think. And I always get confused when you say index five. Do you mean that this uh, this q thing has some circle value that has uh, is it five as the circle value or square root five? Square root five. Square root five. So you, you mentioned that topologically generated is a really great definition. Yeah. Does it have strong topological consequences then? Why, why do you mean that? Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think, so I've received some angry emails from people who should not, shall not be named saying, you know, topological is not a good <laughs> word. It should be just generated. So <laughs> you raise a good point, you know. I, yeah, it, it somehow, yeah, it's really an algebraic notion. Perhaps it's a misnomer. <laughs> How much is it generated? It was generated was defined by a, a certain. Uh, so your group was generated if it satisfied a certain property. Was yeah. it clear that there exists a group with that property? I'm sorry. Uh, so it's that there exists something with that. Oh, uh, like, so there exists a thing. So this step where you take the, the thing generated. Yeah, yeah. So yes, uh, it will exist because by by synaptic kind of consideration, so you just you look at the. Uh, uh, so you have some initial fiber functor at this level, and then uh, the, the, the quantum subgroups are associated to the same five fiber functor. And then you look at the intersection of the morphisms. So somehow the, there's this common fiber functor lying around, which allows you to prove the existence. Yeah. So a question would for, for maybe some people here would be, can you reformulate this notion without the use of a fiber functor? So is there some purely categorical notion of top level? I don't know. Any other questions for Nick? All right, let's thank our speaker again.